O oh, sacred stream, a stranger I would stay to see thee passing by, and mark thee wandering thus alone, with varied turns so like my own. Wild, as a stranger led astray, I see thee wind in woods away, and hastening through the trees to glide, as if thy gentle face to hide. John Davis eighteen sixty five it was the year after four years of cruel war at a frightful cost of six hundred twenty thousand lives the great destruction of both the southern economy and much of the landscape the confederate general robert e lee and his twenty six thousand seven hundred sixty five troops finally surrendered at appomattox courthouse to u s lieutenant general ulysses s grant it was the year president lincoln was inaugurated for his second term as U.S. president, and a month later, shot by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. It was that year, in the Market Square of Springfield, Missouri, while Bill Hickok shot and killed Davis Tutt in what was regarded as the first true Western showdown. 1865 was also the year that on April 5th, a village about 54 miles east from New York City was ready to be called the Town of Clinton. That year, an election was held. The chosen mayor, Morris S. Steiger, and the councilmen were ready to manage their newly incorporated town made up of two main streets connected by a bridge on the south branch of the Raritan River. That year, the two main streets filled with businesses of all kinds. The blacksmith, the spinning wheels, the chairs, the dry goods, the coffins, the newspaper, the bank, and the saddler the small town of about 500-some citizens, lived in style and began to distinguish themselves from the rest of the surrounding farmers. Clinton now looks pretty. You will hardly know the place when you return. Archibald Taylor By the time Archibald Taylor took over the Hunt's Mill and proudly wrote the letter in the 1830s to one of his sons, George W. Taylor, about how much the village had changed, Clinton had already been developing for about a half of a century. It started in 1751. The West Jersey Society of London sold 4,180 acres on the east side of the South Branch to Malin Kirkbride, a landowner from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. A year later, another rich landowner from Middlesex County bought over 800 acres on the west side of the river. In 1761, David McKenney became the first settler. He bought much of the land on both sides of the South Branch of the Raritan River from Kirkbride and Robeson. He built a stone dam, a stone grist mill, and a house nearby. Later, he bought more land to expand his ownership. In the end, he owned more than 600 acres of land in the area. David McKinney was about 26 years old when he bought his property to build a mill. He married a woman named Rebecca Lane, and over the years they had nine children together. Millers and the mills they operated were a valuable community resource. Virtually everyone had to have their grain ground, so that made the grist mill a natural gathering place. He must have been confident in the location that he chose to build his mill. He needed to have 
fast moving water and a place to build a man-made dam in order to harness the water power. McKinney continued to purchase land until he ran into legal troubles. One lawsuit involved his dam. In 1764, Christopher Vogt, his neighbor, sued him for 150 pounds um, due to flood damages. And that was a lot of money back then. He wasn't very lucky. After eight years, he was forced to sell his property by court order at Burlington. The same property was sold to Malin Taylor on May 9, 1776. Then it came to the Revolutionary War. During the wartime, landowners formed militias. Taylor's mill was used to grind flour for the Continental Army. Nehemiah Dunham, a great cattle raiser and dealer at that time, supplied the Continental Army with vast quantities of beef. Abraham Bunnell used his tavern to hold meetings and raised a regiment of Minutemen. He became a colonel of the 1st Regiment of Minutemen in New Jersey, then colonel of the Regiment of the Line. By commission from Congress in 1776, he became a member of Washington's staff as Commissary General, which was the position he occupied until the close of the war. Adam Hope, who was a primary landowner and lived not far from the west side of the river, became a colonel of militias. He once invited his men to his house for breakfast. Captain Thomas Jones helped gather and hide the Dunham boats, later used by General George Washington to cross the Delaware River. New Jersey is considered the cockpit of the American Revolution because both the Amer British and American troops traversed the state a number of times. Hunter and County and Clinton didn't really see that much as far as battles or skirmishes are concerned. Nevertheless, Clinton actually did serve a, an important role in the Revolution. For instance, since the winter of 1779 to 1780, while Washington's troops were encamped in Morristown, ground wheat was supplied from the mill on the south banks of the Raritan River, where the Hunter and Art Museum is currently located. Also, we have a story about General Lee, who was captured in Basking Ridge at White's Tavern. He was writing some letters, and some British troops came along and captured him in his dressing gown. The American division that was under his command devolved to the command of General Sullivan. The troops were stationed at that time in Vealtown, which is present-day Bernardsville. The troops passed through Clinton and a number of them were told about 40 of them stopped at Captain Adam Hope's house for breakfast. Now Captain Hope's wife was Sarah Dunham who was the daughter of Nehemiah Dunham and they were served breakfast before they passed through Clinton crossing the Delaware River down at Lehigh and passing south through Pennsylvania to meet General Washington just prior to the Battle of Trenton. And that was very important for General Washington because he was eager to see the additional troops arrive so that he could make his planned attack on Trenton to capture the Hessian garrison there. It was Daniel Hunt, a Lawrenceville native, who made the Clinton area more commercially alive. He purchased the property from Malin Taylor in 1782. It included both the east and west sides of the south branch of the Raritan River. Local people began to recognize the area as Hunt's Mills, for the Hunt's family who owned much of the town's commerce. At that time, one said, there were few recognizable residents on the east side of the area. One was Samuel Perry's house, another was near the Baptist Parsonage, the third one was Philip Gulick's house, the fourth was the residence of the Hunts, the mansion of the neighborhood. On the west side of the river, one was General Hopes, the other was Dunham Mansion. Hunt's family business was now very active. Daniel Hunt's son, Ralph Hunt, served as a justice for the Court of Common Pleas and as the clerk for the county freeholders after graduating from college. When the family business was passed on to him in 1810, he built a new mill on the east side of the river, which we know today as the Red Mill, the building of the Red Mill Museum Village site. 
Daniel Hunt's other son, Benjamin, practiced medicine after he graduated from Princeton University and a medical school in Pennsylvania. His grandson, Ishii, became the first postmaster when the first post office opened in the village in 1818. Both the Hunt brothers were well-educated and distinguished men. However, their mill business caused them a lot of problems, and this affected their reputation, especially Ralph's. The property was heavily mortgaged, and it wasn't generating enough money. At the same time, Ralph's creditors went after him. And on September 20th, 1823, he lost all the family's property um, when it was sold at sheriff's sale. Benjamin, who was a doctor, was not very involved in running the business, and he moved to Ohio a few years before. So after the loss, Ralph followed his brother to Ohio to start a new life. The village continued to grow. The blacksmith opened for business, and Cooper and Taylor stores were set up and running. In 1817, the village had its first schoolhouse. The teacher was Nathan Wakefield. The classes were held in an existing shop in the village, about 100 yards east of Lee and Center Street. Seven years later, in 1825, a Sunday school, which played the most important role in the lives of the community, was established. In 1827, the first district schoolhouse was built. By the time Ralph Hunt lost all of his family wealth in 1828, and Archibald Taylor, a well-known local landowner and businessman, bought Hunt's properties, the village had two taverns, two hotels, and more newly built houses. 1828. Archibald S. Taylor set up his elder son, John B. Taylor, as a merchant miller, and let him partner with John W. Bray to make the milling a family business. They took the business over and renamed the village Clinton as a mark of honor to DeWitt Clinton, governor of New York, who died around that time. DeWitt Clinton was a very interesting man. He was mayor of New York City. He was the lieutenant governor of New York and the governor. In 1812, he ran against James Madison for the presidency of the United States. He lost, gaining only 89 electoral votes, but actually a difference of one or two states, he would have become president of the United States. He was also a driving force for the creation of the Erie Canal. And um, he served a number of roles for this country up until his death in 1828. When he died, unfortunately, his family was destitute. A lot of communities wanted to honor DeWitt Clinton, so they named their towns after him, which wasn't, a very, which wasn't an unusual practice, actually. So we have not only Clinton, New Jersey, but we also have Clintons in Louisiana, in Arkansas, in Maine. There's even a Clinton in Illinois that's found in DeWitt County. The village now was large enough to be drawn on Thomas Gordon's map. It was a very good map for its day, Alstein Blauvelt said. It was on the scale of three miles to the inch. The brooks and the carriage roads were traced upon it, and it exhibited not only the very small villages, but if in any locality a name had been given to but three or four houses, that name was to be found on the map. July 4th, 1825, John W. Bray. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make a toast for our young, ambitious land, the state of New Jersey. One day, we will become as important to U.S. manufacturing as the British towns of Manchester and Birmingham are to the English. Also, wish General de Lafayette a safe journey back to France. Salute Lafayette, the defender of our rights. John B. Taylor. In the early 1800s, 1825 or so, Clinton, like most of America, had undergone a lot of industrial changes. Um, the, uh, the growth and sophistication of the economy has allowed for people to have um, time for leisure. You're going to see that in the town. 
um, the town in the early 1800s was not just centered around farming. You'll see that they had taverns, they built churches. Um, the family unit became very strong. Um, you still have outside uh, townsmen that are farmers, but a lot more of a transition towards um, your townsmen being merchants and businessmen in the early 1800s. Um, your first churches are there, and then you also have socialization. Um, in the 1800s in America in general, you'll see a much more strong um, go, uh, gear towards family, mother, father, mother staying home, taking care of the children, um, whereas their ancestors were more um, worried about survival. So you're getting into much more uh, time period where you have um, time for leisure, strong family unit, um, and farmers turning merchants. Um, the earlier settlers of, of the town were mostly farmers. A lot of their children weren't educated. Um, now they're mostly merchants, and the merchants' children are going to school. When John B. Taylor and John W. Bray started their family business in 1828, Enoch Stevenson also set up his saddle and harness shop in town, hoping to make a good living. William Smith was preparing to build a new tavern on the corner of Center Street to compete with General Hopes, a long-standing old tavern on the west side of the river. The local residents were also ready to receive their preacher for the regular preaching of the gospel in the village. The first preacher, William Miller Carmichael, came to preach in the stone schoolhouse in the village, and later preachers like Hutton, Campbell, and many others were also assigned to come to the village to provide their services. Now, these 200-some communicants in the area were more than ready to have their own church. Jesus, with thy church abide. Be her Savior, Lord, and guide. While on earth her faith is tried, we beseech thee, hear us. May she guide the poor and blind, seek the lost until she find, and broken-hearted bind, we beseech thee, hear us. Save her love from growing cold, make her watchman strong and bold, fence her round thy peaceful fold, we beseech thee, hear us. T.B.P. We should build the church they said. In the winter of 1829, those leading merchants, John C. Dunham, John W. Bray, John B. Taylor, Nehemiah Dunham, Adam W. Dunham, Archibald S. Taylor, and some others held local meetings to discuss the matter. They set up a board of trustees. Together, John B. Taylor and John W. Bray donated a fair-sized lot on Center Street to build the church. A year later, in 1830, they started to construct the church, and it was completed that same year. Hardly any good thing was attempted in Clinton without Colonel Dunham as prime mover. Probably no man has ever lived in the village who more completely combined a universal popularity, eminent capacity for affairs, and high-toned Christian character. Pastor Alstein Blauvelt. In the early 1800s, the townspeople worshiped together through Sunday school. Um, obviously, uh, church was very important to them. Prayer was important to them. Not only did it bring people together as a community, but it also gave them a social outlet. They were working hard as merchants and farmers all week, and it gave them a chance to get together, and it helped really build a stronger town. Out of the need, in uh, 1830, they broke ground on the first church in Clinton. In 1830, Patterson, the major industrial city of New Jersey, had 17 cotton mills employing 5,000 men and women. Newark businessmen branched themselves into a regional industrial hub, manufacturing goods from leather trunks, clothing, and jewelry to cutting tools and wagons. That year, Clinton also shined with business boom. John T. Lee, a local-born handicap, was later elected as a first councilman, and the second mayor of Clinton opened a brick manufacturing business. He later expanded his business with his brother under the name Lee's Brothers. 
they bought and sold wool and grain. In a few years, Lee got rich, owned most of the land in the area, owned the Clinton National Bank, and built a symbolic mansion. John W. Bray and John B. Taylor, the owners of the two mills and the kilns, were also eager to expand. They came up with all sorts of business ideas to maximize the use of the mills, including the woolen manufacturing process by offering carding, spinning, weaving, and fulling services. Their enterprise expanded even further, using their store as a base to trade goods as far as New Brunswick. But they ended up losing everything. John T. Lee was born on April 19, 1821, with poor health. He didn't have much education. At age 12, he went to New Brunswick to learn how to run a business. He then came back to Clinton to start his own. His passion to get rich prevailed. John W. Bray, a son of a lieutenant in the Lebanon militia during the Revolutionary War, came to Clinton starting a distillery near Hunt's Mills and pursued his brother-in-law, Archibald Taylor, to bring him into the mill business. His passion to get rich failed. He frequently called on me and expressed his high estimation of the value of the Clinton property and advised me to purchase it. This I repeatedly refused to do, but he repeatedly urged it and used many arguments to induce me to purchase. Among others, he represented that it would someday be an advantageous situation for my children to engage in business, and that if I purchase at any price short of $20,000, I must realize out of it the loss I would sustain by the intermediary encumbrances. Archibald S. Taylor John Bray didn't succeed in business. His social and religious reputation were ruined as well. On July 23, 1836, his membership of Presbyterian Church was suspended by the session. Dishonorable failure in worldly business. Conduct totally inconsistent with the order of discipline of Christ's house. Clinton Presbyterian Congregation. What happened to John Bray was significant because of the prominence that religion played in the lives of the residents of Clinton and the United States as a whole. The period of the first half of the 19th century was known as a, as a, a period of religious revivalism, um, sort of what we know now as the Second Great Awakening. Uh, it was sort of a backlash again, that had inspired the thinkers like Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine and Benjamin Franklin. Uh, there were hundreds of uh, preachers roving the countrysides um, throughout the United States, setting up camps and inviting people to come in. Uh, the most famous one probably from that time period would have been the Reverend Charles Finney. Uh, his, the people that he would, would come to see him um, and convert would often be so overcome with religious zeal that they would be jumping up and down, shouting, even barking. Beginning in 1815, a major wave of immigration occurred. It resulted in an average of seven or eight ships per day carrying immigrants from Europe and docking in New York Harbor. Of those who landed in New Jersey, 31,000 were Irish. Among them, there were the Mulligans brothers, Francis, Patrick, and Terence. As most of the Irish flocked into Patterson, Newark, and Trenton for jobs, these three brothers chose Clinton as their home. Francis Mulligan arrived in New York in 1837 at the young age of 20 years old. Before he found a job in Clinton working a crop or labors in 1840, he had been to Monmouth County, then Trenton in New Jersey, and then to Roshi Halls in Pennsylvania. That year, he was joined there by his younger brother Patrick, fresh from Ireland. Shortly after, his older brother, Terence, came to join them. Five years later, Francis had made enough money to purchase a lot on Halstead Street and $100 hard cash. A year later, he built a three-family house on their lot, sharing with his two brothers. In 1847, he bought a small piece of land which adjoined the Mill Quarry site. In 1848, the quarry became an entirely separate business for sale by the Easton Bank as part of the foreclosure process. 
Frank and his brother Patrick successfully bid to purchase the quarry with the terms being $100 down and a $500 mortgage. Now they set motion for their family business legacy for years to come. In 1855, for some unknown reason, the three Mulligan brothers, James, Terrence, and Patrick, suddenly left the town of Clinton. Whether there was a rupture in the family or whether there was some other crisis, we really don't know. All we know is that Patrick wound up in Iowa, where he died at age 70. The two other brothers are lost to history. James, the brother who remained, did not buy the property of the quarry. Perhaps it was because he didn't have the money. Yet five years later, according to the 1860 census, he was leasing the quarry property, and later his sons would buy it. There would have been many Irish families living in Clinton. It was rumored that a railroad was coming through the Clinton area. It gave every indication of a soon-to-boom population. Many of the Irish workers at the time were attracted to the local industry. They thought the Clinton area was a great place to settle down and create a more stable living than laying down railroads. However, they soon learned that a station was built in the tiny hamlet of Beaverbrook near the Eastern Pike. It also happened that the Highbridge area had many more job opportunities because of a newly built branch line from Highbridge to the Morris Canal. It soon had many more Irish Catholic families than Clinton. <laughs> During the years of the Mulligans and their extended family settlement in Clinton, it attracted other Irish immigrants to the area. Some said that the railroad soon would come through the Clinton area, giving the false indication of a soon-to-boom population. As a result, not long ago it was still a pure Protestant's land. A few years later, the Irish loomed Halstead Street. Mulligan families, Dalrymple family, McGinnis family, William Lockerty family, Michael Gooley, Thomas Kinney, Patrick McGran, Eugene McLaughlin, and their parish church. In later years, the Quarry family would intermarry. There would be children born in wedlock, and a few half-siblings and step-siblings in the mix. No one knew whose father was whose, one said. As the Protestants in the cities such as Newark and Patterson never really accepted the Irish as fellow citizens because of their social, economical, and religious statutes, those local elites of Clinton, however, seemed to downplay their reaction to those new settlers. However, the citizens of Clinton barred their children from going down that area, considering the violence associated with the place. This attitude was dragged into the mid-19th century. During that time, Clinton continued to prosper, and more churches were built. Protestant Episcopal Church, a house of worship, was built in 1838. Methodist Episcopal Church was built in 1863. In the summer of 1864, the Civil War was stretched into its fourth year, and the Union struggled to fight the bloody war. That year in Clinton, the new generation of the Mulligan family was looking at the opportunity to regain the ownership of the quarry property from George Gulick. Meanwhile, the native merchants continued to expand their size of the businesses. Morris S. Steiger later became the first mayor of Clinton, with John, after many years of trading, got rich. John B. Weller bought the Union Hotel earlier from William Smith, becoming a well-known hotel in the village, which later was used to hold the first town meeting when the town of Clinton was incorporated in 1865. Robert Foster was working his way from a spinning wheel chair and coffin maker to a well-known Clinton's capitalist. John A. Young, a former miller, was in his eighth year as a member of the first board of directors for the Bank of Clinton, which was the first bank established in Clinton history. John T. Lee, one of the founders of the Clinton Bank and a director, 
and the largest landowner in the village of that time, was enjoying living in the only brick mansion in Clinton that he built for his 18-year-old wife, Mary Van Sickle, three years prior. Also in that year, in August, Mr. Graham, a builder from Jersey City, and Eli Bozenberry, an architect, were hired to remodel the Clinton Presbyterian Church on Center Street. The home of many of this village found themselves carrying the responsibility of this village. On April 5th, 1865, the town of Clinton was incorporated by Act Approved. All that part of the townships of Clinton, Franklin, and Union in the county of Hunterdon contained within the following limits shall be, and hereby is, erected into a borough or town corporate, which shall be called and known by the name of the town of Clinton, and the inhabitants thereof shall be, and hereby are, incorporated by the name of the inhabitants of the town of Clinton. From that moment on, Clinton officially became a town. April 19, 1865, the mayor and the common council of the town of Clinton, having been sworn into office and having filed their oath of office with the clerk of said town, did by order of the mayor, held their first town council on the 19th day of April, 1865. Present, Morris S. Steiger, mayor, John B. Weller, Eli Boysenberry, John T. Lee, James B. Hoffman, John A. Young, and Lou L. Madison, councilman. The incorporation of the town of Clinton at that time had resulted then in the interests being reflected among the citizens, not just the uh, wealthy landowners. It gave voice to everyone to come and participate in the development of the town and have their interests heard. That continues to be done as former chairman of the planning board. Um, the, the town now has a voice for merchants, citizens, people who commute to New York and come back here to live uh, after work. All types of community organization now are heard through this development within the town. Our traditions uh, are not unique to any country other than America. We have uh, encouragement of many, many people to be on council, uh, to run for mayor. Uh, political parties don't matter at all in our town, whether you're Republican or Democrat or something in the middle is irrelevant. We vote for people based on what's good for our town. I think also that Clinton is uh, unique, uh, not unique, I should say, in that we look forward to hearing from uh, the views of people, the residents, and trying to accommodate them. Uh, we take pride in our schools, and that's one of the reasons our taxes are so high, because we have provided well uh, for the education of our young people which not only benefits the young people, but also the land values in town. So I think that those traditions of democracy, of, of listening to public opinions, of doing nothing in secret, openness, uh, complete transparency, this is all part of what Clinton's about. And they're early American values. Um, from the time Clinton was created, incorporated in 1865 until today, and even before that, I'm sure, but mostly since 1865 when it was incorporated. Interesting about the town of Clinton is the um, how it's changed but yet still maintained its sense of community. I grew up here, so I graduated Clinton Public, North Hunterdon. You know, and as a kid, the idea is you gotta get out of Jersey, you gotta get out of, but the minute I had my family, the first thing I, I knew was I have to go back home. I have to be able to raise my family in that same kind of small town community environment that I just absolutely love and so many people do. You know, you, you see it going by the wayside little by little and you see the the larger, um, you know, big box communities kind of encroaching, but yet we've still managed to maintain an autonomy and maintain a vibrancy that too many other times you don't see.
Having lived here for many years, I admit I love the town of Clinton. Why, you ask? I love the click-clack of the Clinton Bridge, our proud town hostess, welcoming towners and guests alike. I love to see the fishing poles dance along the river's edge, under the watchful eye of the mill, strong and steady, an ever-constant reminder that the past is just a footstep away. I love to see the ice cream stained faces of my neighbor's children glow against the bright lights of our vibrant storefronts. I love my detour to the local coffee shop for my morning joe. I imagine myself 150 years ago on that same bridge, viewing that same mill with that same sweet sound of our river singing. Mm-hmm.